Counting to God, Part 1. We are discussing the book by uh, Douglas L., written in 2014, Counting to God, A Personal Journey Through Science to Belief. It's published by Attitude Media. Um, I don't know that they have a, uh, an address in the traditional sense. I wasn't able to find one anyway, but uh, they are, of course, available on the Internet, and that's what it is, attitudemedia.com slash pdf question mark file equals counting to God book. Um, partway through the early part of the book, it says, all rights reserved. Um, I, that's my misprint. Uh, it was actually a misdictation. The computer didn't catch that. All rights reserved. No part of this book may be reproduced in any form or by any electronic or mechanical means, including information storage and retrieval systems, without permission in writing from the publisher, except by a reviewer who may quote brief passages in a review. And I read that and I thought, oh, no. Well, I wrote to the company. And uh, in case you're wondering what the red boxes are, they're blocking out emails that I don't want on the Internet. Uh, they may want this on the Internet, but I didn't take any chances on that. Um, and I had written them, you can see below. Um, and he said, Paul, thanks very much for your note. I think Doug would not have any objections to extensive quotes. As long as you give credit, as long as you credit him in the book as the source. We'd love to see the link to the presentation when you have it. Thanks. So uh, this afternoon, once it's done, I, I'll try to send them the link. Um, the book was designed, I guess you can get a hard copy if you want to. You have to pay for that. Um, but this is the design of the front page or the... I think the the cover, um, and uh, uh, we'll just jump right in. Uh, part one, setting the stage, and part one has a couple of pieces. One of the, the first one is, of course, chapter one, the great question, and uh, he starts out. Let me ask you a question: Do you think we live in a meaningless universe, and human beings were created by accident? That's I thought I'd corrected that, but not. Um, that's a um, misunderstanding by the uh, dictation uh, machine. Um, or do you think we live in a universe designed and created by a great intelligence and human beings were designed? Accident or design? That is the question. What do you think? I think it's a great question. I think it is the great question. It is about the existence of God. In this book, I, that of course is Douglas L., uh, will share new clues for what it's worth. Everywhere you see yellow, that's my additions or subtractions or whatever, um, not his original source. And since this isn't copied straight from it, I may get a few typos, as you've seen, there's one already. Uh, they come from an unexpected source. They come from science. Modern science strongly supports belief in God. Did you know, and there's a whole bunch of things that he says, did you know, that scientists don't have a mildly plausible theory for the origin of life? He talks about the universe and um, several other things. In fact, we're going to get to a list in just a little bit where you can see where he's going. Um, as our scientific knowledge grows, so does the evidence for a designed universe. That's not the message of our mass culture, but it is the message of hundreds of scientists, and their numbers are growing. You may not be ready for this message. I wasn't. Like millions of others, I thought our modern world had no place for God. I love science. I doubled majored in math and physics at MIT. And so he is a lawyer, but he obviously has quite a bit of scientific training. Modern science is consistent with the Bible, with the three faiths of Abraham, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. He, as you'll find out, he's a Christian himself now, uh, but um, uh, he is, uh, I think fair, it's fair to say he's trying to be inclusive here. 
And strange as it may sound, science and mathematics are now the foundation of my faith. You have a right to believe. Not just a legal right, but an intellectual right. There's a cultural war over your freedom to believe. Just as you have a right to believe, you have a right not to believe. We all have doubts and beliefs. When it comes to God, you have a choice. We will examine beliefs about God using reason. We will get there with reason and proven scientific facts. Uh, skipping a couple of paragraphs there. It's a marvelous quest, but it's also one that many are reluctant to embrace. Many theologians shy away, perhaps in part because of a fear that their faith will be damaged by a negative answer, and perhaps in part because they think the world of science and the world of faith do not intersect. Again, I'm not reading the whole paragraph, and I'm skipping another paragraph here. I have spent years explaining technical concepts in reasonably plain English, and this is my goal here. It is often very difficult for the existing mainstream paradigm to change as new evidence appears. Mainstream academic economists continue to teach and preach the virtues of collective economies even as the Soviet Union imploded, um, again, dictation problem, and China embraced markets. Sigmund Freud was popular on college campuses long after working psychiatrists had moved past him. And continuing the paragraph, it took a long time for behavioral finance to supplant efficient markets theory, despite overwhelming evidence for the former. And so it is with the great question. There is stunning new evidence of design. I will use reason and modern science, not blind faith, to make the case for God. You decide. I think that there's an implication that the stunning new evidence for design has not made it into college campuses at that point. Or Wikipedia or uh, National Geographic or some of the other kind of popular things. Chapter 2 is entitled The Good News. And it starts, How Can Science Reveal the Existence of God? Many base their choice on a myth that science has somehow displaced religion. Modern science has revealed a universe of absolute wonder. This book is about a largely unnoticed consensus between the mystic and the scientist. I think if I were being precise, I would say, and some scientists. Um, or maybe it would, be, uh, it would be the true scientist, but that uh, prejudice is the case a little bit. Um, skipping down a little bit further, the good news of this book, the good news of the third millennium, is that modern science strongly supports both belief in a greater reality and belief that both our universe and life itself were designed. 2,000 years after the Gospels, science proclaims a new message of hope. Um, he's detailing um, seven wonders that he's going to talk about, and these will form the basis of part two of the book. Something caused our universe to come into being 14 billion years ago. And of course, the question is, could that something be God? The universe is fine-tuned for life. Uh, life is a miracle. Life has technology to dazzle. One is how do you form it, and the other one is uh, kind of reinforces the technology to dazzle and, uh, pardon me, reinforces that life is a miracle and also reinforces the origin of wholly new, new species remains a mystery. Now that's phrased carefully because I think he would agree that some species are close enough to others that they really don't change that much and that, um, that it's not every new species, but it's 
wholly new species. Our Earth is special, and if you're counting at this point, we've only gotten to six. I have seven. Uh, I've included the whole paragraph because I think it's important. Quantum physics challenges traditional concepts of matter, space, and time, and invites a different way of looking at reality. We'll consider one such way, fully consistent with verified experimental facts, that strongly points to the existence of God. Those of you who've been in the Sabbath school class may recognize that we've occasionally delved into quantum mechanics. And you can see uh, that there are others um, uh, who recognize the, the same um, implications for quantum mechanics. I'm going to skip over. It, it looks like 10 paragraphs, but it's really 10 very short lines paragraphs. Um, and say, although I do not share their point of view, I am not troubled by atheists. I can see how a person could conclude that there is no God. Although I do not share their point of view, I am not troubled by agnostics. I can see how a person could conclude that one does not know and perhaps never will know whether God exists. I do reject the misuse of science in the debate. The proposition advocated by a small but vocal minority of atheists that science somehow reveals the folly of religion is wholly false and dangerous. And I most strongly reject the animosity, even hatred, that has arisen against those who dare to suggest that science supports belief in God. So you can see he's strongly on the side of uh, the intelligent design people in, in the argument. And then he, uh, he, approaches, he broaches the subject of theodicy, uh, has a paragraph on it which I won't quote completely, but he refers people to Timothy Keller in The Reason for God. And basically what he's trying to do here is, uh, is say this book doesn't deal with that subject. And if you want answers, go elsewhere. This book follows my 30-year journey to reconcile science and religion. This initial part sets the stage. It introduces the science, the concepts, and the history of the great debate. I'll tell you about my journey. We'll look at what science is and what is religion. Pardon me, what is science and what is religion and why they are allies, not enemies, in the search for truth. We'll consider the concept of a paradigm and why many scientists choose to ignore or seek to explain away the current evidence of design. Part two reveals the science of belief, the existing evidence, and generally follows the order in which I explored each subject in my journey. We'll start with the creation of the universe and the fine tuning of the laws of physics. It's interesting, you know, his background obviously is math and physics. And so he explored the area that he was the most familiar with first. Next comes the mystery of the origin of life, the technology of life as revealed by molecular biology, and the puzzle of macroevolution. Then we journey back to physics and recent evidence that our Earth is special. That, of course, uh, is uh, the privileged planet hypothesis. Uh, and to complete the paragraph, this part ends by suggesting a seventh wonder of modern science in the mathematical nature of the universe combined with the non-material facts of quantum physics. So he's going to hit quantum physics, or at least the implications of quantum physics, pretty hard. Part three sums it up. It begins with a review of the scientific arguments and counterarguments for belief. It ends with my final thoughts, how I connect the dots after 30 years. Where possible, I'll try to keep it light. And then he keeps it light here. We're only talking about the existence of God and the meaning of life, using concepts not much more complicated than general relativity and quantum physics. <laughs> you do not have to, uh, need to fill out a single government form. More seriously, I want to reassure you that this book does not require heavy math. The primary concept of number in this book is exponents. So you're going to see 10 to the minus 23 or 10 to the 
57 or 10 to the 78, and it's helpful to understand that. Uh, trust me, you can follow the math in this book. If you can count to seven, you can count to God. I wrote this book to give my children, and hopefully you, a choice. That gives you an insight into what he's really after here. Um, skipping down, this is the story of my journey through science to belief. And now he's going to tell his personal story. Chapter 3, and underneath it says, why me? And I'm not sure why he included that. Um, it's possibly because he feels that he's typical of atheists who need a, a little help in this area. But uh, it'll be interesting to see if he comments on that. Uh, if you study science, this, every chapter starts out with a quote. Um, I, well, all but maybe two or three. I, have, I didn't look at them to be, speci to be specific. But the, the, quest the quote that, that starts this chapter is from Lord Kelvin, and it says, if you study science deep enough and long enough, it will force you to believe in God. And then he starts the chapter itself. This chapter is about my personal journey the twisting and the process that I went through over decades seeking the truth. It is not required reading, although he thinks it obviously may be helpful to some. I cannot say I believe in God solely because of science and mathematics, but science and mathematics are now the foundation of my faith. I had thought the opposite. I thought science and mathematics would guide me away from ancient myths towards some modern, more rational reality. When I was young, I liked numbers. I really liked numbers. He tells the story of how he started counting numbers from one to a million to his grandmother. Oh, I can count to a million. Oh, that's sweet. Would you do that? Yes. And he, of course, he gets started, and his grandmother kind of lost interest after a while. Uh, another thing I actually thought was fun in early grammar school was to write down two very large numbers perhaps 20 or more digits each, and lie on the living room floor and multiply them by hand. Wow. Yep, quality fun. So you're, you're dealing with a nerd here, I think that's fair to say. <laughs> um, skipping on a little further, of all the great questions, one has preoccupied humanity since the dawn of time. Are we, in all of existence, here by accident or by design? Um, and he goes on to say, I first thought of God as a kind old man with magic powers. In Sunday school, I learned that God used to be cranky back when the Old Testament books of the Bible were written. My earliest religious philosophy was simple. At one point, God got fed up and drowned everybody except for Noah and his family. Lucky for us, Jesus Christ was born. And God cheered up, and things have been better ever since. <laughs> when I was very young, my church gave me a Bible, and I decided to read it. I didn't get far. Some of the first stories in the Old Testament gave me problems. I wanted to believe, so when I heard about people who lived almost a thousand years each, Methuselah and others with weird names, I asked my mother, I don't remember what she said, but I finally decided it was probably a mistake of some kind. Maybe the numbers were written wrong or the person who copied them couldn't understand the handwriting. <clears throat> my faith was tested and it held. Not for long. The next chapter in Genesis tells the story of Noah and the great flood. Right from the beginning I had problems with this story and they got worse as I got older. For starters, there are dozens and dozens of different kinds of antelope. And was I supposed to believe the lions and tigers walked calmly onto the boat and didn't bother anyone for 190 days or whatever? Sure. I realized there was a big problem with bugs and some other creatures. There are millions of different kinds of beetles, spiders, flies. Did Noah collect two of each? How could he tell male from female? What about snakes? I, um, he also says, well, why would Noah do that? 
I also couldn't figure out what happened to all the water. If the whole earth was covered by water, water so deep that it covered the highest mountains, where did it go? Now, I will note here that to those of us who are creation scientists, that sounds kind of foolish. Mount Everest rose by, I think, almost every creationist theory during the flood and was not as high as it is now. Um, most people would say the same for the uh, Andes, the Rocky Mountains, and so forth. Um, and so you don't need nearly as much water as you might think to cover the world. Um, but you can see how this kind of thing took hold of him and of interest in the book Creation Reconsidered, it surfaces to somebody else. And I thought, how stupid can you be? But then I guess if nobody tells people that the high mountains weren't there to begin with, then it does kind of make logical sense. And so, you know, one of the things I'm thinking of is why wasn't somebody explaining that to him when he was a kid? Might have made a lot of difference. Then again, maybe not. As you can see, I found it hard to believe this story of Noah and his ark. I realize now it holds meaning for many people. But my young faith choked on this story, and I stopped reading the Bible. I tried to take the text literally, and my copying mistake idea didn't seem to work. And I think this is an important thing. It's This is not copying errors. This is not moving a digit somewhere. This is, uh, you know, when people talk about the first chapter of Genesis not being accurate, they're not talking about, well, actually, Eve met Adam before or something. They're talking about the whole story is bogus. And it's important to keep that in mind. I began to doubt God in the Bible. I read Karl Marx's statement that religion is the opiate of the masses, and he also, if religion would have had to have been invented. Uh, my belief in God got weaker. At one point in high school, I wrote my minister and told him I didn't believe in God. He wrote back a nice note and sent me a short book. All I remember of the book is its title, Your God is Too Small. Some of you may have remembered that was a fairly popular book at one time. Looking back, I think my minister hit the nail on the head. He knew exactly what my problem was. But in spite of that, he says, my belief faded. I became the perpetual student of my family. This is an interesting confession. Um, uh, you hear about people who are perpetual students, but uh, we're meeting one now. Um, I considered myself an atheist. I went to college at MIT. I spent more than 10 years in college and graduate schools. I got an undergraduate degree in math and physics from MIT, then a graduate deg degree in theoretical mathematics from the University of Maryland. I obtained a law degree, but, uh, well, and I considered God, I treated God like a joke. The day finally came when I had to get a serious job. And by this time, he's Law is the, what he can do for a living. Life changed pretty fast after that. I didn't really go back to church until my early 30s after my son was born. I went to occasional services for the holidays like Christmas and Easter, but my heart, my soul, wasn't in it. I had a nasty attitude on the inside. I shut God out. A year after my son was born, my wife decided we should join a church and get him baptized. And he said, yeah, why not? No harm in it. There didn't seem to be much downside to a few visits to the church. On the one hand, if there's no God, as I thought, then all I've done is waste a little time to please my wife. And, you know, that's worth something. On the other hand, if there really is a God, I had it covered. I thought I was smart. I thought it outsmarted God. <laughs> uh, my plan fell apart our first Sunday. One problem was that there was, there was some really nice people at the church we went to. Another problem was that the minister was great. 
To my surprise, I enjoyed his sermons. I was most impressed with his inner sense of peace. I could sense a bit of that same wonderful calmness and peace in some of the other people at church. I didn't know what it was. I just knew I wanted it. Uh, skipping on a little bit, we started to grow to church regularly. But in, in spite of that, I struggled with old doubts. And then uh, I'll make some of this shorter. They moved to Martha's Vineyard while the, uh, the Douglas L. continued to work in Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, that was a kind of an interesting way of housing your family. And as a result of this, he spent a lot of times on airplanes reading. And some of the stuff he read were things about the great questions. Many books on these subjects talk past each other. They ignore or berate opposing, opposing views. I have attempted to avoid unproductive and gratuitous criticism. I do openly challenge those who deride religion as being contrary to or in conflict with modern science. This book weaves together technical, religious, and philosophical discussions. I hope that my background of my independence from traditional academia, you know, he doesn't have to produce papers in, in uh, uh, physiology or whatever field he would be as a scientist, um, and then worry about somebody coming down on him hard because he doesn't believe. Um, I hope that his, ba his background in independence from traditional academia makes me a good weaver. I hope to co convey technical ideas and philosophic concepts in reasonably plain English. Before we get to the science, part two, we're going to look at what is science and what is religion, uh, with which I agree with him wholeheartedly. Um, we'll look at the concept of paradigm shift, how accepted concepts of space and time in the universe uh, have shifted over human history. I think that may be and the universe. That may be one of our dictation things. Um, and how difficult it is to change the current bias against the existence of design in the universe. We'll review the history of the great debate over the existence of God and the latest scientific tools for detecting the existence of God. Now, that's the end of that third chapter. Um, frankly, I will have to say that I like Douglas L's approach. Um, it is remarkably similar, um, although not as extensive as, as my approach in scientific theology, which is, was published by La Sierra University Press. That's right, that's that La Sierra University Press, uh, and is online right now. Uh, as we shall see, he is not a short-age creationist, but he does believe in a God who created the universe and can intervene in nature. And um, I think it's fair to say if, that if one follows him, half the battle is over. Um, but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, Ariel, uh, we'll give you the first comment since uh, you've covered some of the same territory before. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I find it interesting. He has done exactly what I did in my book, uh, Science Discovers God, which is you know exactly the same topic here. And that is uh, he's attempted to redefine science. And, uh, well, actually, in a sense, he's a attempted to define science the way it used to be exactly. before, the, uh, before uh, materialism took over. Th this is the, uh, the argument I, I present, is that uh, the pioneers of modern science, I'm talking of people like Newton, Galileo, Kepler, Linné, La, uh, not Laplace, uh, Pascal, mm -hmm. uh, these, these people believed in God, and they believed in the Bible, and they believed in the flood. These were 
uh, you know, uh, basically shortage creations. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't get real technical about how short. Well, but, in the case of Newton, it was 6,000 years. Yeah, well... Uh, that's pretty clear. That's pretty clear. Uh, and, and so uh, what has happened here, and what is, I think, the big lesson for us is that science originated in a very theistic environment, a very theistic philosophy at that time. Uh, there was science before that. There was Islamic science and so on. But the surge, the big surge in science, which occurred when Newton... Uh, kind of emancipated it from uh, fairy tale stories and so on and put mathematics into it. Uh, that uh, science worked very good and you can do very good science believing in God. These folks believed that God had created the laws that made science possible, the laws of mathematics and science that made science possible. And what happened, of course, is that in the, starting mainly in the middle of the 19th century, uh, science redefined itself. So if we're going to accuse him of redefining science, uh, this is not a new practice. Uh, redefining words, of course, is the way you win a lot of arguments. Uh, but uh, this, uh, his doing this, I think, is, is very gratifying in that uh, scientists need to realize they have restricted their outlook. Uh, they won't look at the question, what if God exists? No, uh, it's, the question is, how did things happen without God? Uh, it's the wrong way to go. And it really looks like an exciting book. Other comments? How many chapters? Um, I think about 14 or so. Is he Adventist? Uh, no, he is not Adventist, no. Did he say uh, what he does for, oh yeah, he's, yeah, he's practicing lawyer. law now. Yeah. In fact, he connects his, uh, his law degree with uh, the rest of uh, his science because he says that uh, what the law is supposed to teach you is logic. Um, uh, which is an interesting take on it. Uh, 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 of interest, uh, Philip Johnson was one of the founders of the intelligent design movement, and he was a lawyer, and he points out that one of the things that he is trained in is to recognize uh, valid and invalid arguments. And I think that that's an important point. Um, that is to say, uh, law, if you, um, what I would say properly, uh, as opposed to win at any cost, um, should actually help one to think better. Uh, I, yes, um, let's pass the mic back here. You're going to get two mics at once here. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I love the fact that he mentions his own children, that he wrote it for his children and others. Maybe thinking back that that's where he, he started as a child, um, learning a, as a little boy, and, and then, you know, following another path. I heard a pastor recently say, um, he was trying to bring hope to parents whose grown children had wandered from, from faith in the Bible, and he said, you know that the verse says, train up a child in the way they should go. He said, I've seen, I have seen children 60, 70, 80 years old who have found their way back and remembered the early training of their, of their parents 
and it was a it's a it was a very mm -hmm. um, strong hold when they finally let God work with them, and um, I thought that was a really I had never heard heard it from that verse. You know, we we tend to think we we train up our children, and then when they're old, you know, if we've done a good job, <laughs> but. Some do come in later. And I think it was the slave trader. What was his name? He, he Isaac yes, who, who said that? Yes, Wilberforce. That um, when he came to God, he, he made the comment that he lost his mother when he was seven years old. But he remembered things in those early years before his mother died that came back to him later on in his life. And um, so I just share that. Got to start with the little ones. Well, I, I think that you're right. Uh, I, you know, I hear uh, this is what happened to me as a kid. And, uh, and it sounds almost like <clears throat> at the end, and I don't want it to happen to my kids, so I'm going to try to clue them in as to how science doesn't disprove the Bible, that in fact the two are compatible. And I, I think that's a really important point. Um, but I think he's trying to make a little bit of a stronger statement than that. He's saying that he basically rediscovered God through science. And that is, um, much stronger than science doesn't oppose God. Yes, I think you're right about that. I think he views science as an, a, an actually pretty strong positive argument for God. But he seems to leave the door open for going beyond science and really in a uh, person looking for truth ought to open his his uh, mind beyond science, what, because you're limiting yourself to a rather simplistic mode of thinking if you just limit it to what we traditionally call science, because all kinds of things seem to happen beyond that. Um, I'm speaking of our, our, our sense of purpose, our sense of right and wrong, and all these other things that are love, uh, per se, uh, science doesn't do very well trying to touch these things, and we know they exist. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things I know, because I've read the whole book, is that he is, he is not, at this point, a short-age creationist. And so when you're reading that, you want to kind of keep that context in mind. Well, frankly, um, I don't want to quote the entire book, uh, partly because we can get through it faster, but partly also because I want you guys to go back to it, because I think it's a fairly, there, there's a lot of context that I've kind of skipped over that's in the book, and I strongly recommend that you read it. Uh, it's a good read. Uh, yes, we had a comment here. I just had something to say, so he kind of um, perplexed my mind, just having, um, just the ability of using logic and questioning and having an open mind is, I think, essential to growing in your faith. Um, I come from outside, or I'm a Seventh-day Adventist now, but um, I grew up in the Catholic Church, and um, and also, like, your comment about the kids, so I'm the only SD in my family, and um, that's been really hard, a crazy journey, but I'm super happy. I, I love it. Um, it's just been really hard, though. My parents grew up, we all grew up in the Catholic Church, my parents included, and um, I just think you just become so numb. Just this is the way things are. This is the way, you know, tradition is. This is the way, you know, if you question anything, like, it's just like, why are you questioning? Like, and I just even talked to my mom about the simple fact of, why do you baptize babies? Like, you know, why, why is that? Why do we do that? Like, just questioning that. And then reading the Bible and finding out the truth. And I think that's just so central um, in the science perspective and then the spiritual perspective because clearly God uh, works in people in, in different ways. And, you know, whether it, the math it comes first and spirituality comes later or spirituality comes first and then the logic and questioning comes later. But I just think um, questioning and 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 
open having both points of view and looking deeper into things is central. Well, I think that's one of the uh, one of the geniuses of the Adventist Church is that it is open in a very important way. You know, we take the Bible as as <coughs> as a rule of faith, but haven't really we. The, we finally come down to the point where we say, well, we as a church kind of view these things as, as being biblical. Um, but even there, we're reluctant to say, and this is the way it will always be, you know, um, sort of like the creeds uh, uh, would kind of lock things into a rigid formula. We're not... We, we explicitly say that, you know, we may see new truth or we may find better ways to explain it. And if so, we will change the beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's true for every person inside of the church as well. And it's one of the reasons why I think we need to be very, very careful about solving our theological problems by diktat. Um, because... In reality, it doesn't solve it. It has to be something that we actually internalize and we believe for ourselves, not something that so other people tell us to believe in because they are so authoritative, we bow to that. Um, and frankly, if you think about it, that is an attitude that is extremely helpful in science as well. That is to say, it's the same attitude of you know, it's the fact and not the fact that you're a professor at Harvard or, or at Oxford or someplace else that makes those facts true. No, you can do the experiments yourself if you don't believe the experts. And, you know, sometimes they get it wrong. <clears throat> and so we have to always go back to how do you know? And the way you know is twofold. Number one, it's experiment, and that trumps everything else. And then number two, it's well-tested theory, uh, but the theory is only as good as it is well-tested. And so basically it goes back to experiments after all, or experience where experiments can't be done. Uh, and... The fact of the matter is there is no such thing as a scientific authority. Or to put it another way, people are authorities precisely to the degree and because they are transparent. You can trust them to report what they actually saw. Or you can follow their logic. You can follow their logic. It's not they say it and you got to believe it. It is that actually, come to think of it, their logic makes sense. And so nobody is an authority in science. And that attitude carried over to religion is very, very compatible with Adventism. Yes? If I'm not wrong, today out in the U.S. anyway, there is a march for science. Uh, have you heard about that? I, I have heard about it. I don't know whether it's occurred yet or not. I haven't paid that much attention to it. But Is it happening today? I thought... It's Earth Day. And when they march for science, what are they really marching for? Well, some of them are actually marching for authoritarian science, which I have no use for. Comment here, uh, you want, and then we'll get you third, okay? Yeah, I won't say much about March for Science. Part of it is the march in favor of um, mm -hmm. scientific fact, if I can call the global warming issue. It's being proclaimed as fact, and how people are trying to undermine science when they deny global warming. So that's, that's only one issue. There's many issues. A lot of it involves uh, science education and uh, 
creationism mm -hmm. is certainly in the background of a lot of people's minds. But what I wanted to comment on was the nature of science uh, and faith. The nature of faith has an objective element and a subjective. And you cannot separate the two. When you go to Hebrews 11, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Evidence is objective, not seen is subjective. And so you have a delicate balance always between objective of aspect of faith and subjective. Now, Carl Henry was a um, evangelical rationalist. He loved the term rationalist, and Dr. Roth, you might uh, resonate a bit with that, because what he would argue, I've read... Yeah, this is the founder of fundamentalism, if I remember The founder correctly. of neo-evangelical movement, um, the post-fundamentalists. Oh, okay. He came along after the 1930s. But you if know. I recall correctly, he would put himself in the, that camp. He was uh, very much at home with the fundamentalists, but he said we have to now move beyond the fundamentalism of the 1920s where mm -hmm. um, you take everything so literally. And Well, what he was afraid of was the anti-science attitude of fundamentalists. You know, mostly preachers, unfortunately. <laughs> they, they would just uh, go on a tirade from the pulpit once there were radio broadcasts in the 1930s. They were going on a tirade against modern science. And Carl Henry said, no, science has a lot to offer. Let's milk it for all it's worth. Now, the point I want to make about Henry is that he said the Creator, the Creator has built into the human mind categories of thought, rational categories that no other creature has. The fact that we're going to deal a lot with mathematics uh, from this book, these are categories of thought that no other animal has. And that's the image of God. I, I thought that was beautiful how he ties it together. Mm -hmm. The image of God is that we have the ability to think abstractly, we have the ability to think religiously, and we have the ability to communicate with God through our mind. That's, uh, that's the only mm -hmm. means of communication. Ellen White brings that out. The, and the so, capacity to think and to do, I think, is the yeah. last phrase. So what he started was a uh, evangelical rationalist movement that laid the foundation for intelligent design. So you can see the connection. Henry was very active in the late 40s, 1950s, 1960s. In the 60s, he became editor of Christianity Today, and he wrote my, about 30 or 40 books. Um, that laid the foundation for intelligent design of the 1980s. So I'm drawing the dotted line so you can see how it all ties together. Yes, Ariel. Uh, I think we need to keep in mind uh, uh, science is highly successful. Science has done a lot of good things. Uh, wonderful things, and it is considered a, the most secure way of arriving at truth by scientists. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, science is more secure than a lot of other modes of thinking. Certainly better than politics. Oh, th thank you, thank you uh, for that very good example. Uh, but. Uh, we need to keep in mind that while science is very successful in that area, and this book is going to show you how within that realm, you're going to be forced to believe in miracles. And you can have a God or you can have them just popping out, whichever you like. But you're going to, be, you're, you're going to have to face that, you know, when scientists say, well, we can't deal with miracles because there's no way to test them. Well, then they can't deal with certain parts of science. 
Well, or they're restrict they're restricting their science to uh, what science doesn't lead you to. Yeah. Which it does when you look at some of that data. And so it, it uh, the thing that we need to keep in mind is that agnosticism and atheism to a certain degree ride on the success of science by restricting what even science says doesn't exist and that is uh, these, all, these, all these highly improbabilities. Well, he touched on some of them, the origin of life and so on. Yeah. All these problems here. Uh, and so, so science is good, but it's very limited and it's too simplistic for reality. Um, I have an issue with this term miracle. You know, miracle, can, can we just imagine what it would be like if somebody were somehow transported in our midst right here from, say, a hundred years ago? They see various devices around. They would, I mean, they look at this, they wonder, what on earth? And, and they, then you speak into it and you can hear yourself. And you yourself. speak into it and you, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, and they think, ah, miracle. Well, don't you have to have wires for that? Yeah, we, we, we have other ways of explaining that. The, the thing is that the moment that you understand something, it ceases to be a miracle. Miracle is only something that we don't understand. But it happens, and it happens to be fortuitous for some reason. And we're glad of it, but, but we can't explain it. So we say, oh, it's a miracle. But guess what? The moment that the understanding expands sufficiently to include that event, it stops being a miracle. So why should science be afraid of things it cannot explain? It means it hasn't grown yet to get to it. Why is that a problem? It wasn't when science was found. Uh, I was curious about Warren. Um, finches will pick up a little stick and put it in the hole and the uh, insects uh, Ants will climb on it, they get it out, and then eat the ant. I think Freud did some experiments with uh, animals. You know, so uh, one can start arguing, saying, uh, "Come on, maybe they can solve maths if we train them enough." You know, I, I just uh, well, as so. a matter of fact, there was a parrot, and, and this is now on video. So if you want to look it up, uh, Alex the parrot uh, is able to count how many green boxes, uh, how many green squares there are, how many red triangles, how many blue circles, um, and get the number correct, words, like 90 plus percent of the time. Understands. Well, he obviously understands enough to be able to distinguish between, yeah, yeah. say, red triangles and blue triangles, and and between uh, red triangles and red circles. So, and, and to count, up, uh, he can go to six if I understand it correctly. There's a horse, I saw that. Uh, well, Mr. Ed. Uh, yeah. No, not Mr. Ed. A little horse. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ed. So, um, so many times. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. huh? No, it is. I saw something about that. Okay. Yeah, there was, there, was a, there was a horse who was very, very sensitive to his owner. And the owner would move his head a little tiny bit without realizing it when the when he was time to stop, and so that that got out there. Um, but I think I think there were some that 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 could do some counting. The one thing that I will say is that I have never seen a chimpanzee present a scientific paper yet, <laughs> and I I I don't expect to see that in the future. Uh, and I think it has to do with the chimpanzee's limited ability. I knew when I made the comment that, that animals don't, 
do a mathematics that someone would come up with a <laughs> an illustration. Maybe they do a little bit. Um, mathematics. Well, can count to four at least. Yeah. Because if four people go into a house and three people come out, they won't go into the house until the fourth person comes out. Okay. So that kind of... I, I want to protect myself a little on that. <laughs> uh, it depends on the way you define mathematics. I, I had in mind mathematics is not only counting, but the manipulation of numbers in functions that can l lead to new results. So, you know, when you multiply 3 times 7, you get 21. I don't know of any parrots that can do that. <laughs> well, I can tell you this, I don't know of any untrained parrots who can do that. Yeah. But that <laughs> anyway, I think uh, we have I'm a comment back here as well. Yeah, I want to, um, we're going to move away a little bit, okay. but uh, when the tsunami hit, especially in Thailand, the water suddenly went down. And all of us, very intelligent people, ran in the ocean. But the elephants, the, 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 uh, uh, the um, dogs and all, they all ran up the hill. And we are very smart people. We went in there, people <laughs> drowned by the thousands. Yet they do have senses that the Lord gave yeah, that we don't have. Um, Hitler... I think operated on a couple of premises. Number one, if you tell a big lie long enough, repeat it again and again and again, people will believe. That's number one. Number two, you win the hearts of the little kids. You have it made. Um, I think that's what's happening in uh, this country. In, they repeat it again and again. Paul, we have lost several generations of Adventists. Of Christians in general. Oh, Christians in general. And, uh, you know, I believe every believer writes a book. Whether that book is published or not does not matter. This gentleman has. I mean, you have. And so has the L. Um, we all write a book, whether it's published or not. But, you know, uh, I believe a time has to come when truth has to be revealed in its real divine beauty, and that's your and my task. Okay, pass it back. Um, on the subject of miracles, <laughs> first of all, only a hundred years ago, I think they invented how to communicate electronically. <laughs> so we got to go back more than a hundred years. It's already 2017. So uh, 1917, there was a, a lot of the modern world is already in, in going on. Yeah, telegraph um, then, yeah. And, and people can kind of, well, if you can do telegraph, maybe you can do telephone, uh -huh. and pretty soon you're transmitting pictures, and, yeah. and uh, with uh, lots of technical development, now you have the Internet. Right. But as far as Mary, I, I agree with what he was saying. I was just <coughs> trying to make a point there. Uh, the, the idea of miracles, um, you hear in evolution all the time, the miracle of evolution. You hear this being said. It's, it's when uh, an experience takes place that uh, exceeds or goes beyond the, the known laws of physics um, or, or experience. It just happens like that. So we see this miracle. Um, all this debate that we're seeing more and more, at least I see it, um, between um, these, these militant atheistic uh, scientists against... Uh, what they perceive as creation or creation under the guy's intelligent design. They don't want to see it as legitimate science. They, they want to hold on. It's almost a form of delusion. And as Ariel said earlier, you know, they come to this science with the premise that there is no God. You have a multiple a universe, of, uh, multiple universes, uh, an infinite number of universes, where anything can happen except for the idea that God can be in existence. So it's the only limit that they put on this multiverse is that there is a God. And what we have to remember also, I think, as Christians, is that miracles happen when somebody who is born evil, someone who is tainted uh, by sin, and even Jesus said, if you then being, born, you then being evil uh, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your Heavenly Father gives the Holy Spirit to them that ask. I think we have to realize that um, 
when Peter made the explanation that Jesus was the Christ, and Jesus said, this is your father has revealed this, not flesh and blood, I think in Adventism we have this problem of thinking that if we show this rationally, if we can put out all the facts, then somebody who may be delusional is going to somehow say, oh yeah, now I see the evidence of God. When in fact it has to be something I think, I mean it's not comfortable to say, but almost a miraculous uh, uh, transformation must take place where someone can actually see evidence of God when they really don't want to see evidence of God because that's their nature, is to see a lack of God. For some reason, this is what appeals to the natural man. Um, it's the same as with the Sabbath. There are, there are millions and millions of Christians who believe in God, who love God, and yet, no matter how many times you show them the evidence and all the biblical texts, they still do not accept the Sabbath because I don't think God has revealed that to them. I, I don't think we can just dismiss it. I just think it's something we need to be aware of and not to uh, maybe condemn or not to just throw our hands up as the other side might, but to actually work even harder and to pray more fervently that they might see uh, what we see. Because it's not that we see it of our own abilities. I have no extra ability than anybody else, but yet I believe God has revealed to me these things. So in that way, it is a miracle, because by nature I don't want to see it. But by God's providence, I do. So. That is the miracle of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is a miracle. Someone else? I think in one word, authority. The world does not want authority. And that's what God represents. Human nature is against authority. And we're all born with a nature leaning away from God. Well, you know, it, that's a kind so, of a interesting um, duality because we, we do tend to rebel against God's authority. It's inconvenient. He wants us to do things we really don't want to do. On this, at the same time, we are willing to take the authority of other figures. Well, that's true. In some places, it's religious figures. In some places, it's scientific figures. Richard Dawkins says, and I believe... <laughs> yeah. no, I, I guess I, I'm thinking more really of, of moral authority. I'm thinking more of things that affect my life. Well, I, I, I don't uh, want. Uh, there are plenty of people yeah. who take authorities in that sense too. You know, uh, maybe it's because those authorities agree with what we'd really like to do in the first place. Uh, um, so it's it, it's. Uh, it's a little bit of a nuanced subject. You know, we do, we, do, we do like authority. It's just we want the authority to agree with us. If I may suggest that our big problem is how we handle truth, how we relate to reality itself. We are not happy being subject to it we would like to be able to somehow control it. We want to be in charge of what is true and what is not. We want to be the ones who decide, aha, this is the way it has to be. The problem is that God himself has submitted himself to the examination. Christ says, the Father judges no one because he has committed all the judgment to the Son. But then he says later, the Son judges no one, but the words which I have spoken will be the judgment. What does that mean? It means at the end, the big judgment day, we're going to be in a state of collision with the obvious, the truth itself. That is, unless we choose to align ourselves. Unless with the we are willing to learn from it. If we're not willing to learn about the truth and from the truth, we become people who want to invent it. And that is bad science. It's also bad politics. As it's we also have bad seen. religion. It's also bad religion. It is just simply bad. Hmm. There is no endeavor of humans or uh, anyone else that is rendered somehow more noble by that venture.
have another comment over here. Oh, did you want? Wait go ahead. Just, just a thought about authority. Um, I think there is a, are a lot of people who do rebel against any kind of authority. They want to do their own thing. There, are, and even they may cross the line because there are other people. You know, it may work both ways depending on what the topic is. But um, there are people who they love a strong. They love strong leadership. We're, I'm going to solve all your problems. Putin in Russia, they, he's very popular because he's going to solve all, you know, he's, he's a tough guy. And even our own president, he's going to solve all, the, all of our problems. And um, the czars, I think the czars got by with, because they were like, Oh, it, it goes back millennia to gods. You know, these, these leaders ship take on a god-like, they're a, a god-like figure. So I think it, it can, we, we love authority and we can hate it also. And there are different people that gravitate to one side or the other. I don't recall this uh, scientist's name. It's a Russian scientist that basically said at a conference, either God exists or he doesn't exist. Either possibility is frightening. <laughs> if he does exist and we're not following his will, then we are guilty. And if he doesn't exist, what is our purpose to begin with? Pointless. It is pointless. So basically what he was saying in his book is he found God through science, but then you have a scientist saying either he exists or he doesn't exist. Which one do you believe? Mm. Either way, it is frightening. <laughs> there a comment down here. I would suggest that the kind of God that so many portrayed does not exist. And this is part of the problem. Uh, what is God really like? And then I, when I hear uh, these discussions, I think, what is free will? Does anybody really have it? Because it um, depends. <coughs> Our authority figure is the authority figure of the people that uh, are peers. I mean, somebody goes into science and they never go out of their bubble. This is a word that's very <coughs> in vogue now, uh, people live in bubbles. We live in a bubble here at Loma Linda. We, uh, we only talk to people who uh, agree with us most of the time. Um, the certain... Um, well, we'll see if we can help break out of that bubble every once in a while. The certain you know, people in the politics, you see that right now, They're, they have their separate bubbles and they can't see beyond them. And uh, they, have, they pick their authority figures, whether it's through the university or through something else, uh, a union or whatever, and they can't see beyond that. They're in their private bubbles. So how do we have free will? Well, the one a good argument can be made for the fact that most of the time we don't have free will, that most of the time we do uh, react automatically, and that there are a few key times when we have free will and then the rest of it, we're slaves to whatever we've decided to be slaves to. Or all the other religions, uh, Hinduism, Muslims. <laughs> Muslims don't seem to have free will. Uh. Well, uh, <laughs> maybe at certain times God speaks to various people uh, in all kinds of circumstances. This is all that I, I can come uh, up with, yeah. And then, uh, because... Because if it was true we had total free will all the time, then you couldn't say things like, okay, this guy, when he gets home, t uh, when he leaves work tonight, he's going to stop at the bar and stay, at ho stay there until, uh, you know, one o'clock in the morning. And sometimes you can say that with some pretty fair regularity. Guy's a slave to drink. He's addicted. He's not really free most of the time. That there will be a few times when he will have the choice 
And then the rest of it, we're stuck. And in fact, I think that gives you, that gives some weight to Jesus' comment about he who is, ends as a slave to sin and to go on to say that if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed because our natural state here on the earth is frankly one of slavery. <coughs> People who say that we're slaves, they're partly right. Uh, Christianity, Adventism in this world and around the world, I mean in this country and around the world, would be different if indeed we had the servant attitude of Jesus Christ, the truth, I am the way, the truth and life. When we talk about truth, we're talking Jesus Christ, you see, and he knelt down and he watched, and if you want to be a, if you want to be a leader, let him be a servant. And that is so, so much needed in our families, in our homes, all over. I think things should be different. Gandhi of India challenged the Indian saying, the Christian saying, if the Christians in India lived the life of Jesus Christ, their entire country would turn to Christianity. What a challenge, you see. So that great I am of the Old Testament knelt down and he washed the disciples' feet. If you want to be a leader, whoever, let him be a servant. And that truth is not progressive. Our understanding of the truth is progressive. The truth remains the same no matter what. This young lady learned the truth, whatever she learned from. She left her family, went through trouble, and she probably will have more troubles. But she's attracted to that truth, not to the Seventh-day Adventist Church merely. And as long as we have that understanding, I think the Lord will glorify himself in our lives. Well, I'm going to leave it at that because we'll have many more chances to discuss. But um, hopefully uh, you will find the book uh, interesting, thought-provoking, and uh, for many of you, informative, I think, as well. Um, I encourage you to read the book. Again, those of you who get the email, there will, there's a link to it. Those of you who don't get the email, ask me. I'll put you on the list. So we'll see you next week.